Okay, well, welcome. Uh, Russ Pate, uh, glad you could join us. This is part of the ACSM's Distinguished um, Leaders uh, program that we're videoing and archiving. We've done 36 of these so far, so thanks for being part of it. Well, thank you. Um, Honored to be included. One, one thing that I just wanted to ask you, Russ, is sort of where you're at now and what you're doing now and then uh, if you could sort of drop back and talk a little bit about your education and how you got to where you are now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still at the University of South Carolina where I've been uh, essentially my whole career. Uh, my positions there have evolved a good bit over the years. I'm currently serving as Vice Provost for Health Sciences, uh, which is an administrative role that involves working with our five health science schools and colleges. Wow. and. Uh, and, and I have uh, a research group that uh, continues to do studies on physical activity uh, and its promotion in children and adolescents. And we're uh, fortunate to have a couple of new grants right now, so I think we'll stay in business for a few more years. So you're able, now that you've switched to administration, you're able to keep your hand in your research then? Uh, well, not yes, as much yes, as you yes, want, yes, but it's not it's not always easy, and yeah. not as much as I'd like sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very fortunate to have some great people uh, who've been a part of our group for uh, some of them a long time, and I'm uh, able to rely on them a great deal. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have great colleague, faculty colleagues around the university that work in our group, and. Uh, uh, it really is because of their their efforts that uh, I'm able to stay involved in research while doing an administrative job. Mm -hmm. Is that a is there a time limit on your administrative stint or? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I've never really seen my even though I've been in administrative positions a lot over the years. I, I've never really seen myself as a primarily an administrator. I I, I, I identify with my faculty role much more strongly mm -hmm. than uh, an administrative role. Well, how did you uh, get to where you are? Where, where did you go to college and what mm -hmm. kind of programs were you in? Well, I, w I was a kid that uh, was one of those kids that, that uh, thought he knew exactly what he wanted to do from a young age. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess I was close, although, you know, things do change over mm -hmm. time. But uh, uh, my dad was a physical education teacher and coach and uh, 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 administrator and uh, athletics and physical education where, where in public schools in uh, uh, upstate New York when okay. I was growing up. Okay. And, uh, and I thought I wanted to do what he did and, and um, so I went, to, I went to Springfield College which he had uh, attended and, uh, and, and uh, really it was when I was a, a junior at Springfield College taking undergraduate exercise physiology with uh, Wayne Sinning uh, that, that um, yeah, I think my current career path really was uh, was established. What year was that, Russ? Uh, mid '60s. I, I, I graduated at Springfield in 1968, so that would have been 1966 or seven. Okay. But Wayne sort of took me under his arm and uh, invited me into the lab to be a subject and then do a practicum with him. And uh, Wayne had attended the University of Oregon, and uh, I, I was a competitive runner and. Uh, uh, so for a lot of reasons, uh, the University of Oregon looked like an attractive like uh, good place, destination yeah. uh, uh, for graduate school, and so I did. Uh, I did go to Oregon for for graduate school. Was there for for several years, um, and uh, when I finished at Oregon, I went in the job market, and uh, the, the job at the University of South Carolina was available, and wow. uh, I, I thought it looked like a, a great opportunity, and. and fortunate to get the offer and, and uh, have been there ever since. Who did you work with at Oregon? Uh, my advisor at Oregon was a fellow named uh, Gene Evanuk, who uh, was uh, actually himself an Oregon graduate, but he was uh, he had done his PhD at the University of Iowa in, uh, I guess what we refer to as straight physiology, not, not, uh, yes, uh, not exercise course. physiology, yes. uh -huh. and um, you know was connected to Charlie Tipton and the whole Iowa uh, crew. And um, uh, he had spent much of his career in, at the Arctic Research Lab in Alaska oh, mm -hmm. and then uh, came back to Oregon and um, uh, a, a number of us that came through Oregon at that time were, uh, were fortunate to, to work with a very seasoned, experienced uh, 
very well networked uh, physiologist, yeah. Gene Evanuk. Uh, Peter, Peter Raven was one of uh, oh, I didn't know that one of Gene's students okay. and okay. Uh, a, a number of others. And of course, the, your uh, Springfield pedigree goes. I mean, that goes way back. There's so many people, Karpovich yeah. and Tipton. And well, I actually like met that. I actually met Karpovich. Oh yeah, he, I was going to ask you that, and I, I thought did. maybe it was a little I, late. I, I did. Well, it was a little. He was re technically retired, but around campus some. As uh, and of course his wife was Josephine Raspa, yes, yes. Uh, who I, I who was still a founding member of the board of trustees when I uh, you know eventually made it onto the board. Of I the interviewed ACSM. her you know, in Indianapolis right. in the eighties. So right. That is and, neat. Um, so I, uh, I, I Wayne Sinning actually introduced me to to, to Peter Karpovich one day. Uh, during my senior year at Springfield, and mm -hmm. it's one of those experiences you never forget. Right. He, was, he was a pretty imposing figure, right. and, and <laughs> but a real gentleman. He was very nice to me. Did you know uh, Ben Ritchie up at UMass at the time? Uh, I, I knew or, I knew of him, but uh, I, I was thinking he studied with Carpenter. He may well have. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure about. He may that, well have. Yeah. Yeah. So did you do uh, sort of environmental physiology at Oregon? Or what, what kind um, of uh, research did you start? Because well, I, I sort of think of you as epidemiology today. Yeah, I didn't start there, though. I uh, okay. No, I, I, I would say I was a pretty traditionally trained exercise physiologist. I was interested in endurance performance. I was a runner. Yes, and, and, okay. You know, I was interested in, in issues related to endurance performance. Uh, my dissertation was a animal model study of blood doping, mm -hmm. uh, sort of artificial enhancement of uh, red blood cell count mm -hmm. and hemoglobin concentration, which was a practice that was uh, really more rumored in humans at that time than I remember uh, established, and, and yeah. so I was interested in that. And, um, yeah, I, you know, for a long time I really did um, research that, that was largely physiologically oriented, but I was always interested in fitness and kids, and that really was from the time I was an undergraduate at Springfield. I had coursework uh, mm -hmm. with, with people who uh, studied that, and then when I was at Oregon, um, uh, H. Harrison Clark was yes, a um, sure. you know, great uh, faculty member there. And, uh, I knew his son Dave at yeah, Maryland. Me too. Was there. Yeah. Me too. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, Harrison Clark had done the Medford Boys Growth Studies, which uh, you know were sort of uh, oh, classical yeah. developmental studies related to fitness in, yeah. uh, in in kids. And so I got exposed to that at Oregon. And then, really, as about as soon as I got to South Carolina, I got connected to a group that was uh, sort of uh, reconceptualizing some ideas related to fitness in in kids. And uh, so that's really how I got tracked in uh, sort of a research direction related to uh, physical activity and fitness in children. So um, I'm trying to think what year it was. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I remember that that article that was in JAMA mm -hmm. that you and I forgot who else was on that. It was such a landmark well, it was piece. A, that was in the 90s, I think. Yeah, 95. Russ, it was, it was yeah. published in 95. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it was a remarkable, the, the experience that led to that publication was, was a remarkable one. And um, I guess the impact of that article oh. is uh, Could you talk un, a little un, bit about unanticipated, that? but. Uh, I don't want you to feel like you're bragging, but I mean, that, I mean, it was so important. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sort of what, right. how all that came about? Because. Right. Well, I think the, the project that resulted in that paper was in a sense almost inevitable because our our perceptions of what the public should do with regard to uh, exercise uh, it really had had uh, I think evolved to the point where they were inconsistent with some of the science mm -hmm. and the perception at that time in the say the 80s and, and uh, early 90s was the the really the traditional exercise prescription which ACSM popularized yes. and but but the image that had been presented to the public was pretty rigid it, it was uh, the exercise has got to be vigorous uh, it's got to be continuous uh, it's got to be you know in in substantial doses probably at least three days a week and the um, the data that were emerging really from physical activity epidemiology at that time 
suggested that um, while that model would almost certainly work, mm -hmm. there are probably a lot of other models that, that uh, would also work in terms of providing health benefits and that it would be important to convey to the public uh, really a, a, a maybe a more um, accessible uh, model for, for physical activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it was um, absolutely a remarkable group of people that came came together. Um, was Steve Blair part sure, of that? Sure. I'm trying to think. Yep. Who Steve, else was, Steve was part of the executive committee as was Bill Haskell, Mike Pratt, Carol Macera and myself were the, the, the executive committee that coordinated okay. the process. Uh, but we had a, a quite a remarkable group of um, committee members that, mm -hmm. that worked on it. Uh, it was really initiated by um, by some folks at the CDC, and this was before there was a physical activity yes, branch at yes. CDC. That's but, pre Mike Pratt, probably. Uh, yeah. Well, Mike was there at CDC, but it was prior to uh, the formalization of a, of of a physical activity right. unit at yeah. CDC. Yeah. But in the Chronic Disease Center at CDC, there were some folks that were interested in physical activity. And uh, a woman who was heading that, uh, that, that center by the name of Marjorie Spears called me one day. I was uh, I think I got the call because I was president-elect of ACSM and I had been working with some folks at CDC, so I had personal acquaintance with, with some folks there, Mike included. And um, I, I, I met her in the Atlanta airport one day and uh, she said, would you, know, would you folks at South Carolina be interested in coordinating a process probably with ACSM uh, aimed at revisiting physical activity recommendations for the public and I, of course I said yes. And so this was in 92, 93 probably, probably 93, around there. Probably 93. Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. Uh, and so we sure. formed we formed an executive committee, uh, then formed a larger panel, um, began drafting uh, you know a paper pulling together background material mm -hmm. and then we all met in Atlanta, a hotel in Atlanta for two days and, and uh, essentially locked the door and said we've got to get this done and it, it was uh, quite a remarkable process and um, the actual core recommendation which was you know, 30 minutes of or more of moderate intensity physical activity was that three times mo a week? no most preferably all days of the yeah. week was the was yeah. the phrase um, the, 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 the core of that recommendation really was not that controversial for the group. I mean, we, we, we really thought, and there was pretty broad consensus, that the available data looking at both the epidemiology and the experimental uh, physiologic studies pointed toward that as an appropriate recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, where the controversy crept in was really in the language that we would use to communicate that. Because we, we, when we came together, we said the idea here is to come away with a, with, with a public health message. So a public health message is supposed to be easy to communicate, um, the sort of thing that the, that the average person in the public could, could hear and understand and mm -hmm. ideally act upon. And um, so the challenge really was coming up with language that would on the one hand be consistent with the science, and on the other hand something that we thought the average person in the public could mm -hmm. uh, you know, could, could digest. Uh, how was that, uh, was there a problem getting that published in JAMA? Or no, no, it, you know, it actually went pretty smoothly and uh, uh, we began early communicating with the editors at JAMA and, uh, and, and so they, they um, you know, we told them what the article would be about. They said, well, we'd be willing to consider that and of course they don't pre-approve anything. Right, you know, right. you've, you've got to write the manuscript and uh, you know, Mike and I worked very closely on the on the paper, and of course, Bill and and Steve and Carol contributed mm -hmm. a great deal, as did others. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, it, it went through, I think, a single revision after we submitted it, and then and then was accepted. And uh, and and you know, I want to I want to make clear that um, you know I'm the first author of that article because I I happen to be the chair of this panel mm -hmm. that, that that did the work. Um, uh, but, but just tremendous folks uh, contributed to that and I'm very honored that uh, Jeremy Morris and Ralph Paffenbarger were uh, 
were authors on that yeah. on that paper. Yeah. So that that gives you a sense of the oh, absolutely. you know the magnitude of the, the you know the the folks that were involved. Yeah. Um, so all that said, it was a group effort. Sure. Um, I, someone told me recently that the article is the sixth most frequently cited article in the history of JAMA, and I don't mention that for. Pers I'm glad you said that. I personal, knew it was significant in my own way. Personal that's, aggrandizement. That's it, I, I think it speaks to, um, you know, the the significance of the of the field and and of uh, probably the timeliness of the yeah. of the recommendation. So shortly after, you're president of the college. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, did. Maybe you could, uh, it, it seems to me that everything sort of went on a fast track from there um, to the Surgeon General's report. Yeah, it was very fast and it was a little nerve wracking in all honesty because you had a Surgeon General's report, uh, there was also an NIH consensus conference at about that same time, yeah. both first time ever for, you know, for this issue. Yeah. And there was uh, some anxiety that when you had other somewhat overlapping but also somewhat independent groups mm -hmm. looking at this issue, that they might not come up with the same recommendation. Didn't, didn't the AHA too, American Heart, have something or, or the, did they join with ACSM? I forgot how yeah, that the, the American Heart mounted what I think in retrospect uh, has turned out to be a remarkably influential strategic planning process. Uh, and. Uh, American Heart had actually, uh, in the very early 90s, I think 91 or 92, uh, formalized their position that physical inactivity was a major risk factor for cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. And, um, and I, I really do think that that was one of the important factors that, that laid the groundwork for the CDC ACSM recommendation, yeah. frankly. Yeah. I think it made it in a, in a sense, almost necessary, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, but then it, it, it did sort of uh, open the floodgate, you know, for yeah. you know for a number of other activities, and you know there was some nervousness that uh, you know we might be at risk of creating dissonance if another group came out with a you know a, a different recommendation that so, didn't match up. But yeah. but we were a lot of us were pretty relieved when. The Surgeon General's report essentially ratified the same, the language was a little different, but the concept was essentially the same. Yeah. And then the NIH Consensus Conference, which really was a group of, um, you know, quite uh, established scientists, but not, in most cases, uh, people that had been close to this particular issue, looked at it in quite an objective way and uh, reaffirmed essentially the same recommendation. Mm -hmm. So I think that gave the kind of the core message there, uh, you know, some weight. Yeah, when I think about, that, I mean, that really wasn't that long ago. No. And the, the, you know, I always like to look at the Surgeon General's report on uh, smoking, mm -hmm. and I think it was in 64, mm -hmm. and say, okay, how long did it take yeah. for change to occur? Yeah, we're, we're um, you know, some of us that are interested in the Really, the public health applications yes. of all this uh, do do use the, the smoking issue as a, as an analog. And, yeah, and, I wondered. And, well, and I think it seems like we're moving faster, in my biased opinion. But yeah, I'm not Surgeon sure. General is ninety six. I hope so. so. I hope so, but I'm not sure. You yeah. know, I, I I do think we're in in this phase where uh, there clearly is increasing recognition of the significance of physical activity to health. Um, you know, physical activity doesn't really have any enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, you're hard pressed to find a person that said, "Well, no, that's ir right. totally irrelevant. Right. You know, not important. I don't want to hear about right. that." Uh, and that's probably a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. uh, but because there, there are times when I'll have to confess, I almost wish we had a, a, an enemy like the tobacco industry. Yeah, so you, <laughs> you could know? fight somebody. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, people and, could get involved. And you know, we don't. But, but. Um, and it doesn't mean there aren't forces out there in society that you have to try and overcome. Mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of them. You know, there are a lot of barriers to physical activity. But um, you know, we don't really have anybody that kind of puts their hand up and says, "No, I'm you know I'm against all that." Yeah. Um, but I, I think we're making progress. But I think I think at the same time, um, if if you look at the resources that that public health in the U.S. 
invests in some other health issues and compare it to what is currently invested in uh, public health promotion of physical activity, we've got a long, long yes. way to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, most, uh, most state health departments have lots of people working on diet and, and you know, say, uh, kind of traditional physiologic risk factors and so on, and, you know, may, may have at most a handful of people that, that are working on physical activity. Yeah. So, you know, we've come a long way. I think we are making progress, but uh, we, we do have a long ways to go yet. Yeah. I could, I'd love to keep talking about this <laughs> so much, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about ACSM. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing you may or may not remember, I'm thinking that on that um, American Heart Association uh, guidelines or whatever, there was was sort of dominated by ACSM members. Yeah, yeah it, it was. Um, there were there were several ACSM members that were a part of that strategic planning group. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I don't think it's at all overstated to say that ACSM and its members have been the driver that that has established physical activity as a legitimate public health issue in this country. Um, you know, I'm also a member of the American Public Health Association. Um, just <clears throat> three weeks ago, <laughs> so it's 2009, the American Public Health Association created, a, for the first time, a special interest group on physical activity. So that's you, telling, you, isn't you, it? Yeah, it is. You see what we're wow. up against. And, yeah. And, and uh, so it, it, it really has taken ACSM and, and its members, uh, its advocacy effort, and, and I think most importantly, the science that ACSM members do uh, and that the college uh, fosters and disseminates that, uh, that, that really has uh, made this possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that uh, were he still alive, Ralph Paffenbarger would say that a ACSM opened its arms to physical activity epidemiology like no other organization did. Yeah. Uh, gave it a home when it really didn't have a home as a, as a subdiscipline mm -hmm. uh, anywhere else. And, and, and uh, PAF, of course, was a, a great epidemiologist in, in you know, just in the, in, general. in the disciplinary sense. Yes. Um, but really there wasn't another organization that, uh, you know, embraced the, the physical activity epidemiology the way ACSM mm -hmm. did, and I think that's reflected in um, you know the, in, our, in our leadership, the leadership of the organization over the last 15, 20 years. Did you get involved with the college at Springfield or Oregon? Or at Oregon. At, at Oregon. Oregon. Yeah, actually, the, my first uh, my first ACSM meeting was in Seattle, and I, I was. Uh, probably a year or so from finishing graduate school at Oregon, and a few of us got in the car and drove up I-5. and uh, That's a long drive from Eugene. I, five hours. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and the meeting was in, I, I remember it well, it was in, um, it was 1973, and, and the meeting was in the, uh, the old Olympic Hotel, mm. and I can picture, you know, a, a room there, and of course, the meeting probably attracted two, three hundred people. Yeah. You know, it was it was a much smaller meeting. I don't think there were any concurrent sessions. It was sort of all one session yeah. at a time. But it, it was, as I often say, it was love at first sight for me. I, you know, mm -hmm. I just, um, you know, I, I just um, was in my element. You know, from from day one with the college. Mm -hmm. So you were president '93 around there. Uh, had you been on the board or anything before that, or what? Did yeah, you sort of do different yeah. things, and I eventually did. I did. I um, I, I <clears throat> became active with the Southeast Regional Chapter really about as soon as I got to South Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, was was very interested in the chapter program. And uh, you know, I knew um, I knew Mike Pollock and Bill Haskell, and they were president I think back to back, uh, and in. Uh, Kind of early in my career, and uh, uh, they they sort of invited me in to, um, uh, to to chair an ad hoc committee on regional chapters. And at that time, 
it's really sort of an interesting history. The regional chapters of ACSM really were not spawned by ACSM as a national organization. Mm -hmm. They were grassroots operations where ACSM members just thought, you know, we, we need to get together. We, yeah, we need a regional uh, organization. And so they looked very different, <laughs> and, and you know they they, they were uh, you know they were each strong in their own way, but but there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uniformity or standardization mm -hmm. or you know clear communication with the national organization. And so uh, my, I kind of cut my teeth with the national organization through the, through the, the, the this ad hoc uh, committee on, on regional chapters. Yeah. What were the uh, were there any big issues when you were president president elect or was it pretty Smooth sailing. Well, I think you know. I'd like to think that, um, that that during the period when I was on the executive committee, uh, we 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 took some important steps toward ACSM becoming more active as an advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. uh, the college has always relied on its science, and I and I you know I believe very strongly it, it must always rely yes. on, on, on its yes. science yeah. core. But I do think that it was along in that period when, when I was on the executive committee that it, it, it started to become clear to us that if ACSM was going to accomplish everything that it, that it wanted to accomplish, we were going to have to become savvy and effective in, in uh, public policy and advocacy. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and so um, I happened to be in that position that uh, you know, around the time the, the Clinton administration's uh, coming into office, and, and you know we did uh, you know we did some advocacy work you know as that administration was coming in, and um, uh, and and I think the college, of course, today is is you know, quite quite established in in its advocacy efforts, and so um, you know controversy I think a little bit because um, you know it, it really meant the college moving a bit away from it, its traditional focus on, on science and, and, uh, and, and clinical applications. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the certification program was well established, of course, earlier, and, and uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, I think not, not everyone thought that uh, that was a direction that the mm -hmm. college should go, but in the end, I think it's, um, it strengthened our science, frankly. That, yeah, well, that, I mean, you need application. <clears throat> Uh, you know, and, and I hear this sort of the talk at this conference is is that from the mainstream science people is that gee we've gone too far. Right. Sure. You know, we, we've got to drop back a little bit. A ACSM, from my pretty lengthy experience with it, it has always had sort of a creative tension. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the strength of the college is is its diversity. Yes. I think yeah, you know. I, I mean, we you know we, we serve educators and we serve scientists and we serve clinicians, yeah. and that's a you know there are not many organizations that that pull that off. Right. You know, most of them that try that fall apart. Mm -hmm. And and ACSM has has held that together. Mm -hmm. I think it's held it together because it has stayed true to its science. I think that's the magnet that holds the clinicians. It's not every clinician that that's that's. Uh, you know, going to be attracted to ACSM, but the ones that like the science are, Definitely. and I think the same is true with the educators and and and. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's true with the, with the you know your point about the policy, is that you can't have practice, you can't have policy without the science. Right. You know, right. The, but, so. but you could also argue you can't have science without policy because it takes resources to do science. Exactly. Yeah. And you ask yeah. yourself, where do those resources they, come yeah, from? Yeah. Federal and, and money mainly. In this country, it's mainly federal money. Yes. And believe me, there are Very a lot point. of people going after it. Yes. So if yeah. you know, if, if we want our issues funded, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think you have to be. Uh, you got to get out there. Okay. Now you're you're involved. I think we're almost out of time, but you're involved actually as we speak in a lot of public policy stuff with the physical activity guidelines. And Right, I, all I, of that. I, I was honored to be a part of the, the um, physical activity guidelines advisory committee, which is for the first uh, U.S. physical activity guidelines that were released in in 2008. And currently, I'm involved with uh, the development of uh, a national physical activity plan 
for the for the first time in the U.S., which um, I you know I think of as very much connected to the guidelines. The guidelines sure. are very focused on providing guidance regarding what people should types and amounts of physical activity that different kinds of people should do. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan will uh, really I, I think in the end be a set of policies and practices that if implemented would make it a lot easier for people to meet the guidelines. Yes. Yeah. Are you representing ACSM in that or is the college part of that or how is it, that ACSM, set up? ACSM is part of it. It's a coalition of organizations. Okay. ACSM is, is, um, uh, is, is one of the lead organizations uh, in that process and frankly has played a disproportionate uh, role, oh. has, has hosted some of the meetings yeah. and, uh, you know, Jim Whitehead is, uh, you know, has, has just been very giving of his time. Yeah, that's one of his strengths. It is. Is, is, that. It is. is the President's Council part of it? Yes, or? they are. They yeah. are. Okay. I was with a couple of folks here okay. yes, yesterday uh, okay. who are associated with the CDC? Council. Yes. Okay. No, CDC really uh, uh, provided the nudge that, uh, jump-started the process, uh, provided uh, some seed funding to help us get going, and mm -hmm. then uh, you know, we approached organizational partners, including ACSM, uh, American Heart, American Cancer Society, AARP, American oh, Academy yeah. of Pediatrics. Yeah, okay. We've got some great organizations That's, that are, yeah. that have committed uh, some funds to this as well. Okay. Well, I see we're out of time, Ross. I'm so happy that you stopped. I could talk the rest of the day with you about this stuff because it's something I'm personally very interested in and I want to thank you for coming by and all the stuff you're doing. It's just pretty exciting. Well, it's my pleasure. So, so, Jack, I appreciate all you, so all you do for the college. Well, thank you very much.